My name is Denise Braxton Robinson. Um, I am 70 years old. I lived in Glassboro from the time I was six years old until 1979. Um, I moved out of Glassboro after I got married and before I had my first son. Um, and, but before that, Glassboro was my hometown. My mother is Mildred Purifoy. My father was Sonny Edwards. Otis Purifoy is my stepfather. And my grandparents on my mother's side was Mildred, I mean Lily, and Archie Aaron. And my grandparents on my father's side was um, Mary and Carrie Edwards which were, um, was my, my mother's name when she was married to my father. Um, my siblings are Vernon, who passed away in January, uh, January 11th in 2018. He was my older brother. He was number one, I'm number two. And then I have my brother, Michael Purifoy, who's five years younger than me, and my brother, Eric Purifoy, who was 11 years younger than me. And we all grew up together, and my mother's saying always was, it doesn't matter who your dad was, I'm your mom, so you're not half of anything. You're all of me, and you all belong to me, so you all belong to each other. So we never had that thing about, well, you know, we got different dads, or it's split. My mom always let us know that we all belong to her and that we all belong to each other. So we were raised to look out for one another and to love one another, which is something that is so lacking in so many young people's lives today. So we're grateful for that. My um, mother had uh, four siblings. Her oldest brother was Ezekiel Aaron. Um, her oldest sister was Olivia Aaron. Um, then my Aunt Singh, who was Vera Aaron, my Uncle Mose, Moses Aaron, and then her. She was the baby girl, Mildred Aaron. And um, they um, were preacher's kids. My grandpa, uh, Archie Aaron, he was a reverend. Um, he built his own church. He had six acres of land where he lived in Franklinville, New Jersey, and where I grew up and ran around his property and ate his fruits and vegetables and just enjoyed that whole type of living. And then my mother's, uh, my stepfather, Otis Purifoy, his mom and dad lived in Glassboro. They had a lovely, lovely home, um, four or five acres of land. We used to go there in the summertime and run around on their porch and um, our cousins, Roxanne and, and Gregory, would be there, and we would spend time with them as well. And um, we just had really a great life. Our, both of our grandparents on both sides were godly people. Um, they grew us all up in that manner. They raised us to know who God was, and they were blessed, both of them, Grandma Aaron and Grandpa Aaron and Grandpa uh, Purifoy and Grandma Purifoy, they were both blessed because of the godly people that they were. And they had much and they shared much and they gave much to all of us. Uh, aunts and uncles, cousins, um, there's so many of them. I don't even know if we have time to go through all of that, but we had a lovely family life. Okay, well, what happened was um, my grandparents, Achi and Lily Aaron, originally were in South Carolina. That's where they originated from. And then they moved from South Carolina to Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And my grandfather's brother, Douglas, was with them when they decided to move to Philadelphia. Once they moved to Philadelphia, um, my, uh, I believe my mother was born in Philadelphia. But once they moved to Philadelphia, what happened was that my uncle Ezekiel got murdered. 
And after he was murdered, my grandfather decided that he didn't want to live in Philadelphia anymore. And that was when they moved to Glasper. Now, exactly how long they lived in Glasper, I'm not sure. But they lived in Glasper and they lived over on the acre side of Glasper at that time. And um, before my mom, before my cousin Inez turned three years old, they, my grandfather brought property in Franklinville and he brought the six acres of land and he brought the six acres of land so that each one of his children could have an acre of their own. So he would have an acre and each one of his children would have an acre. Um, and then my mother um, got married and when she got married, she moved to Philadelphia with my father and then after they started having marital problems, my mom moved back to Franklinville with her mom and dad, and they stayed there. My mom and my father separated and then um, became divorced. And then my mom met Otis Purefoy, and then they got married. And I remember the day that he came to my grandparents' house uh, to ask my grandfather about marrying my mom and to let him know that they wanted to move and that they were going to be moving to Glassboro. And I think I was maybe about mm, five, maybe six at that time. And then that is when we actually moved to Glassboro. So I was about five years old when we moved to Glassboro on 24 North Lake Street. And that's where we lived until I w entered the sixth grade. Well, as I said, when I was in the sixth grade, my family moved from Lake Street, which was on Lake Street, we had a uh, basically African-American block. And I remember all of the people on the block, uh, all of the families, there was children, we played games, hide and seek, uh, double dutch. Um, there was one gentleman that lived across the street. He was the only Caucasian on our immediate block, Mr. Sam. And Mr. Sam was the sweetest Italian man. And we would go over and he would give us fruit. And he was just a really nice, nice gentleman. And he lived by himself. His wife had passed away. He did have children that would come and visit him. But I remember Mr. Sam so very clear, clearly because he was just such a really nice man. And then in the sixth grade, my family moved from um, Lake Street to 106 Somerset Road in Glasgow, New Jersey. And we lived, moved into an all um, Caucasian complex. We were the only African Americans that lived there. We were the only African Americans that lived there for many years. Um, but the people there were very neighborly. Uh, there, were, there was young people the same age as my older brother, um, myself, Michael, and Eric. Um, we did go to school. Um, we walked to school. And I have friends in the complex that we lived in. And I also had friends that lived in a complex on the across Green Tree Road over into the next complex. So we used to walk to school together and walk home together um, because when we moved in uh, Glassboro, we moved in the city of Glassboro, if you want to call it a city. We were in the town. And because we're in the town, we were the only African-Americans, my brother Vernon and I, that went to Academy Street School at that time. So um, most of my friends, by the time they integrated the schools, when I was in the fourth grade, fourth or fifth grade, when they integrated the schools, most of my friends were Caucasians. Um, they, those were the people that I was with all the time. Um, I was smart, I, had, I got good grades, I was a safety patrol and all such as that. And so when the schools were integrated and the uh, African-American students came to Academy Street School, which was like a total culture shock for them as they had been in schools uh, all the time where it was just only them. Um, so when they came to Academy Street School, I was a culture shock 
to them because I had assimilated so well in just being the only African-American uh, young lady in that school and my brother Vernon, it was very hard for a lot of the African-American students, uh, particularly the girls, not the guys. I never had guy problems, but the girls really did not like me a lot. So that caused me some kind of, some types of problems, but um, they were not problems that I was not over to, able to overcome. I just had to really be secure about who I was so that I didn't get caught up in feeling like there was something wrong with me. So as the years went on, I, um, and I went into my high school days, I did have some very, very wonderful uh, uh, friends, friends that I went to church with, uh, Louina Simmons, Mary Lewis, Elizabeth, Patty Booker. Uh, these were African-American young ladies that treated me like I was their sister, uh, Ernestine Smith, um, and, and allowed me to be myself and accepted me for who I was. And so my experiences, um, even with some of the um, Caucasian young people, um, I never had any problems, but you, you never really know. Um, sometimes you become, um, in this society, in the way that things are, if back in the day, if and it might still be true today, I don't really know, but back in the day, if there was one African-American person that, um, that Caucasians uh, could relate to and felt comfortable with, then that became their person. And so I would have to say that when I was in Glassboro and I was going through the school systems, the junior high, high school, even elementary school, I was the Caucasians person. They all related to me. Um, they all invited me to their parties. They all um, took me with them wherever they went. If they cut school, they asked me if I wanted to go. You know, if they got a new car, they came to my house to see if I wanted to ride in it. So I was considered their person. And as being considered their person, it made it hard for me to be considered um, by some, some African Americans as their person. So it, it, it put me in a peculiar situation, but at the same time, it helped me to be who I am today. So I, I, I don't have any gripes with it. I think I turned out pretty good considering all things. Okay, so when I was growing up in Glassboro, there were a lot of businesses in town, but there were also a lot of businesses in the neighborhood where African Americans lived. And so on Academy Street, the McCants had a store, and you could go in their store. They had all kinds of candy, all kinds of groceries. Um, if you go up Academy Street today, and you go across the tracks and up a couple blocks and you look to your to your right, there's a white house there that it kind of blooms out. And that bloom, that part of the house was this store. So you went into the store, um, they, their shelves were always stocked. You never had to worry about anything being missing, whether you needed a loaf of bread or, or a particular candy. Oh, Henry's were my favorite. And that store was always there. Then when you went further down Academy Street on to where Academy and Stanger Avenue um, is, there used to be a store there. It's not there anymore. Um, and that store was, I used to go to Bryant's Temple's Church, and it was on Stanger Avenue. So when you got to Stanger Avenue and uh, Academy Street, you would make a right-hand turn and go across the tracks, and there was this church there called Bryant's Temple. And in Bryant's Temple, uh, we went to church there every Sunday, my brother Vernon and I. We were on the choir there. Um, one of the ladies from the church named Mrs. Johnson, she used to come and pick Vernon and I up and take us to church and also take us to choir rehearsal. And when we would get out of church, and if I would go to my friend uh, Louina Simmons' house, 
we would walk up the street and we would go in that store and we'd go in there and buy those bonbon things, those big hard candies you put in your jaw, and your jaw sits out to here, and whatever other kind of candy that we want. And then also when I was younger, on every Friday, my grandfather used to cook fish. Uh, my grandmother would make fish. And so after work, we would get in the car from Franklinville, this was. We would get in the car and my grandfather would come up to Glassboro and we would go to this fish store. I don't remember the name of it, but it was right next to one of the ladies that went to churches that my grandfather was affiliated with. And we would go in there and my grandfather, my grandma would, would buy fish. She taught me how to pick, pick fresh fish. So if the eye of the fish is not bright, then that fish is not good. If it's got red in it, if it's brown, that's not the fish you want to buy. So always look at the eyes of your fish when you're purchasing it. And the, when the clearer the, eye, the eyes are, the fresher the fish is. And so anyway, we would go in there, we would buy the fish, and then after we would leave there, we would go next, to, uh, next door to one of my grandfather's friend's house, Miss Hickenbottom, I believe it was. We would go to her house and they would sit and they would talk and they would fellowship together. They might, we might have a snack or something and then we would leave there and then we would go back to Franklinville and my grandmother would cook the best fish ever and her favorite kind were porgies. So that was the fish store that we would always go to. And then I, right offhand, um, the other business that I really remember was right next door to Academy Street School. And there was this little lady, I think her name was Miss Agnes. She was the sweetest little, she was a Caucasian lady, but she was the sweetest lady. She had the sweetest door and she made homemade fudge. Oh my God, she had every flavor, vanilla, chocolate, swirl. I believe that's how I got several of the cavities that I had because her fudge was so good. She had all kinds of ice cream in there. My favorite was the vanilla with the orange over it. Oh, that was great. She, and then when we would do Halloween or trick or treat, we would always make sure that we went to, uh, to Miss Agnes's store right next to Academy Street School. And then there was one other business that I remember so clearly is still there, beside the movie theater that used to be there, but still there is that cleaners. It's right there on Academy Street. Um, that cleaners has been there forever. We got our clothes cleaned there all the time until we moved up to Somerset Road. And then my, my stepfather, Otis Purefoy, got involved with a guy named Mike Finelli who owned the One Hour Cleaner. And he used to work there with Mike Finelli and my brother Vernon. Um, um, actually, Mike Finelli opened up the car wash so that my brother Vernon could run his car wash. And that's actually where my brother Vernon started his detailing um, business. Uh, that was one of the business. Then, you know, we had the, the as I grew up, we had the Genos that used to be in Glassboro. Um, the Acme that used to be where the library is now in Glasper, that used to be an Acme market. And we used to go, that's where I, we used to shop all the time at that Acme market. The post office has been there all the time. Um, that, 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 well, I don't know what it's called now, but it used to be called the Franklin, Franklin House. It used to be like a bar and, and uh, a club where people used to go. Um, I remember that distinctly because that used to be like like the hot spot in Glassboro. And then we had the bowling alley uh, that was on Delcy Drive. We used to go to that bowling alley. And there's also a bowling alley further down Delcy Drive, closer to Stanger Avenue. That's, I think, a, it's a thrift store now or something. But when we were in school, in junior high and in high school, that used to be one of the activities that we would go to the bowling alley and we would bowl. That was part of our gymnastics class that we had. So I remember those stores uh, very clearly. And one other, no, two others. In Glasper, on High Street, Joe's Sub Shop used to be 
one of the places where everybody went to get all their subs, all their steaks. Oh, they made the best food. We would go in there and sit in the booth and drink cherry cola. It was so great. And then up the street that is now that was Lake Street, that is now um, Mr. Tartaglione Way or something. That you all the way up at the end of that street before you get to Wilmer was Mr. Laspada's store. And Mr. Laspada had everything in his store, groceries, everything. So if you didn't feel like walking all the way to the Acme, you could just walk up to Mr. Laspada's store and get whatever you needed. There was also further down the street, on High Street, there was a bakery, Elite Bakery. Oh my God, the best cream donuts in the world. I don't think I've ever tasted a cream donut better than the ones that they made at Elite Bakery. And Elite Bakery, they made cheesecake, the cinnamon buns. Oh my God, it was so good. I don't know why they went out of business, but you guys are missing out on that one. And then there used to be across the street from... Um, the Elite Bakery, and on that next corner at High and Ellis Street, Shirley's Market. And in Shirley's Market, they had everything in there. They specialized in cold cuts. And so you could go in there and get the freshest cold cuts um, and whatever else you needed. But they were the neighborhood, the neighborhood stores that were right there, right there for you without walking all the way up into what was considered to be the town. So you could go up the street on Lake Street. You could go to the right on High Street. You could go to Shirley's Market. You could go to Elite Bakery. You could go to Joe's Sub Shop. You could go all the way up the street to Mr. Laspada's store. That was right in my initial 24 North Lake Street area. Then if you went down the street or over to Academy Street, you could go to Miss Agnes's sweet little candy store. If you needed to go to the cleaners, you could go right there to the cleaners. Across from the cleaners where the library is was the Acme. Across from the Acme and up from the cleaners was the movie theater. We all went to the movie theater. And then if you went up Academy Street and across the tracks to the lawns, you could go to the McCant store that they had right there in the neighborhood. And if you went all the way down the street to uh, Academy and Stanger Avenue, there was another store right there. I forget what that store was called, but we used to go there every Sunday after church. Now, one other uh, business that I have to mention is Masso's. Now, when I was a little girl and my uh, like I told you, my grandpa Purifoy and my grandma Purifoy, they lived across the street from Masso's. And so when I was growing up, we used to go across the street there and get sandwiches and stuff like that. And then as I grew up, they put the gas station out there so you could get gas and you could also uh, go and get your sandwiches and, and all such as that. And then right up the street from Masso's on the same side that my grandparents' house was, there was this little cabin shoe store, and they sold some of the nicest shoes in the world. And I remember those two, uh, those two particular businesses. There was also a bar there called Oak Grove, okay? That was a famous bar. Everybody in their mom in the African-American community uh, went to that bar. It, 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 it was just the place where people went and, and they went there and they drank and they act crazy and they partied in the whole nine yards. And then um, as you go back into the town area, uh, so clearly then I go back into the movie theater that was there. Now, um, be before... Before my time, now I was born in 1952, and so when I was born in 1952, um, I, I didn't move into Glassboro until maybe 57. So all the all during that time, I really wasn't going to the movies. So 
But from my understanding, if African Americans wanted to go to the movies there, they were not allowed to sit downstairs. They had to go upstairs, as in the segregated South, where you could only drink from the colored people only water fountain. Well, in Glassboro, you could only go to the colored section of the movie theater there, and that was on the up upstairs. And the Caucasians then went to and watch the movie from downstairs in the theater. But by the time that I grew up and was actually able to go to the theater, that was not a situation that I actually had to deal with. So I can only speak to the part of it that I know. And a, a lot of that um, happened when I was younger, but that doesn't negate the fact that it was so. And there are things in Glassboro that were segregated even to me uh, when I was growing up. You, there were just certain things, certain places where we didn't live. Like we didn't have houses on the ridge. Like I said, when we moved to uh, Somerset Road, we were the only black family there. There were no other African-American families there. And it was many, many years before Stanley and Sarah, who still lived there uh, next to the house at 106 Somerset Road, it was many, many years. I was a teenager. I was 16 or something when they moved into the house next door to us. And then later on, there was another family that moved up the street from us. Um, when they had younger children, and they lived there maybe for about five, maybe 10 years, and then they, they moved on. But there were a lot of places and spaces that were segregated. And there were a lot of places where I went with my white friends that I knew that I was not really welcome there, but they didn't want to because the white friends that, that I had were the pillars of the society, so to speak. You know, the known people, the Leightons, the Flammas, the people that were known in the city. So, um, and a lot of Italians, um, Kathy Flamma in the fourth grade was like my best friend. And so those, because I was with those people, it was the reason why I may not have felt the same intense uh, discrimination that other uh, black individuals in, in Glassboro felt. And that was only because, again, of who my friends were and because when I was going to elementary school, being the only black girl in the class, I remember uh, specifically that um, when we would go out to recess, and you, we, you would get in a circle and you would hold hands. And because I was the only black there, there were white kids that did not want to hold my hand. But the ones that were my friends, they would always put me in the middle. So I would have a white friend on this side and I would have a white friend on this side. And so anybody else that was white on the other side that didn't want to hold my hand didn't have to because they were holding my friend's hands. So I do remember this discrimination from that point of view. I went back into my mind. I was just thinking about different things that happened. And I remembered this one day when I was in elementary school, this little boy, I don't know his name. I can hardly remember his face, um, but I do remember his words and words do matter. And so it becomes so important that we all watch our words in whatever situations we are in. So on this particular day, um, I'm a, I was a walker in elementary school, and I was standing outside the front door entrance of the school on the sidewalk. And I don't know why I was still milling around, but I had not, I didn't go across the street to go home. I don't know if I was waiting for anyone, but for whatever the reasons, I was still there when the bus students came out to go to the buses. And as this one young man came out of the door, he looked at me and he called me a nigger. And 
I turned around and I called him a cracker. And I remember just standing there after he said that, just pondering it in my mind. And um, I don't know if uh, my feelings were hurt. I don't really remember all of the feelings that went into that, but I know that the words, what he called me, that resonated in my mind, and that was something I knew was bad. And the only thing I could think of to say was something that I knew might be as bad if I called him a cracker, that that would get back at him. But the point of the matter was that was something that even now at the age of 70, I can still remember. So words matter. Uh, I only had one teacher in elementary school, and that was my third grade teacher. I don't know if I should mention her name, but my third grade teacher always made me feel like she just didn't like me. And I don't know if she didn't like me because I really was smart, and that's not how she perceived um, uh, African Americans to be. I, I think that I was something unexpected for her um, in that I caught on quick. I was always on top of my program, but she would always um, try to cause me some kind of problems. On my report card, she would give me C's even though I deserved better. And she would always write little things on my report card in the comment sections like, I didn't pay attention or I talked too much or whatever. But it didn't matter because after I had her in the third grade and I passed with the flying colors, I then in the fourth grade had this teacher, and I will say her name because I loved her. Her name was Miss Rulon, and she was young and she was beautiful, and she just opened my mind up to all the things that I could really be and really do and that she actually encouraged me in my giftings and what I could do good and that kind of thing. And then in the fifth grade, literally, I had the best teacher that ever walked the earth. His name was Mr. Whitman. And he was so encouraging to me. So I've always, um, my mom's handwriting was just beautiful. So I always wanted my handwriting to be as good as my mother's or better. So when I was learning how to print and how to cursive write, I used to practice it. I used to sit, practice my letters, and practice my cursive. So when I got into Mr. Whitman's class, because my handwriting was so good and my printing was so good, he would call me up to the board and have me write his instructions on the board because he said my handwriting was better than his. And because of that, I think that was another reason some of the kids didn't like me, but because of that was the reason why I can write on a board, I can write on any blank sheet, and I can make it a straight line. You won't find my stuff going down in no kind of angles or none of that kind of stuff. You could, when I write, it's a straight line all the way across with lines or without lines. And so Mr. Whitman just encouraged me. He just made sure that I knew that I could do it when I would read and I would read a big word that I wasn't supposed to know. He would just make sure that I knew how well I was doing. And um, even after I graduated from high school and went to college, I would come back and go see Mr. Whitman and see how he was doing. Him and his, his son and I, um, his son's name is Timmy Whitman, we were friends and he would keep in touch with me. And when his dad got sick, he let me know and I, I went to visit him. And it was a very sad time when Mr. Whitman passed away. But he was one of my greatest mentors and I'll never, never forget him or Miss Rulon and all that they did to help me to know that I can be the best that I can be. Well, I think the most important thing that reflected on my adult life, honestly, was my grandma, Lily Aaron. Um, she affected my life in so many ways. She was so good. She was such a great grandma. I, 
I, I feel sorry for people that don't get to have a loving, fun, happy, joyful relationship with their grandma. But my grandma was the best ever. And so when I was a little girl, I had all kinds of situations. I was a I sucked my thumb when I was a little girl. I, I, I was a bed wetter when I was a little girl. And so when I would wet the bed at my grandmother's, she would wake me up. She would um, change the sheets. She would change my clothes. And then she would send me back to bed. And she did that for I don't even know how many years. She never fussed at me. She never made me feel like I was less than. She always just let me know it was okay. It's going to be all right. You, you're going to get this together. This is going to pass. One day you're not going to pee to bed anymore. And she was just so good like that. She would take me everywhere with her. Um, she taught me how to cook. She would be in her kitchen. She would be cooking. I would be right next to her. She would tell me to go go in the, in, in the pantry and get the flour. She would just show me how she was doing everything. You know, she was just so awesome to me. Um, every night um, when I was a little girl, we would be up to, in my grandparents in Franklinville, they had uh, a back room and we would be up in that back room. And every night she would have me brush her hair a hundred strokes. And that's how I learned to count to a hundred. So I was counting to a hundred and I was reading way before I went to kindergarten. My grandparents had all kinds of books. So by me, by that happening to me, by the time we moved to Glassboro uh, and I started going to elementary school, I already had a background. I already knew how to count to 100. And there was a lot of things that I didn't have to be taught because I learned them at my grandparents' house. So Glassboro was, uh, my grandma, I was the seed. My grandma watered it. And then I was planted in Glassboro. And after I was planted in Glassboro, then I grew into all of the things that that seed and that watering uh, allowed me to be. And so um, I always um, played school um, and with my brothers and everything, we would always play this, this game called dumb school where you sit on the step and you put something in your hand and you hold it behind your back and the people sitting on the step, then when you put it out, put your, both of your hands out, they have to hit one of your hands. And if they hit the hand that had the, the paper in it, then they got to move up to the next grade. But if they didn't hit the hand with the paper in it, then they had to stay in the class that they were in. So they, they flunked. So that, I guess that's why they called it dumb school. But that was one of the things that I really remember um, and that shaped me towards education. Even though I didn't even know I wanted to be a teacher, I was always teaching. I taught my brother Eric how to write. I taught my brother Michael how to write. I taught them how to count. I did all of that. Michael was five years younger than me. Eric was 11. So by the time Eric got there, I was in full-fledged teach mode. So I taught him so many things before he got to kindergarten, too. So, um, but Glassboro, um, there were so many good things. Um, it was a small town. You didn't have to really be concerned. You could go walking. I remember when my mom used to work at the sewing factory, um, she would get off about 11 o'clock. And I, during the summertime, not during the wintertime, but during the summertime, I would literally get on my bike and go and ride and meet my mom at the factory, and then we would walk home together. And I was never afraid, never worried, never thinking that anything bad could happen or would happen. So it was a safe place. It was a safe haven. And that's something that so many young people don't have anymore. My mom and my stepfather owned a business called the Friendly Cab Company. Um, the Friendly Cab was purchased by my stepfather originally from a Baptist uh, preacher, a pastor named Reverend Jones. And 
he um, owned the company. I don't know how long he owned the Friendly Cab, but I do know that when he decided that he wanted to sell it, my grandfather, Grandpa Purefoy, was a deacon at his church, and he came to his son, Otis Purefoy, and let him know that uh, Reverend Jones was interested in selling the cab company. And my stepfather then stepped right up, and him and my mom decided that they would purchase the Friendly Cab. When we first purchased the Friendly Cab, we again were living at 106 Somerset Road in Glassboro. And when we first purchased it, um, we actually ran it out of the basement in our home. And my mother worked all day. She was always an early riser. My mom was up at 5 a.m. every morning, okay? And before we got a cab, she would be up at 5 a.m. just ironing her clothes. She loved to iron. But make a long story short, she would run the cab during the day. She ran, the, she kept the books. She uh, answered the phones. Um, wh whatever situations came along, my mom handled them all day. Um, and then when my stepfather would get home, when Otis Purefoy would come home, he would then uh, change his clothes, take his bath or whatever, and come right in and go right to work downstairs with the cab, answering the phones until closing time, he would be down there. Now, one thing I will say uh, about, my, about Otis Purefoy Jr., he was the hardest working man I think I've ever known. He was an awesome provider. Even when he didn't have the cab company, he was always thinking of something else he could do to make money. He was a lifer with the National Guards. He was a military police. Um, when he wasn't doing that, I remember when we were kids, he used to take the telephone books around. Um, we, he would have, get an area that he would deliver the telephone books to, and he would take me and Vernon with him. He would pull up to wherever the, the houses were that needed the telephone books, and Vernon's and I's assignment was to take the telephone books out of the wrapper and to put it in the mailbox. And we did that as many years as I can remember before Friendly Cab. He always was a hard working man. He believed in working hard and he always had food on the table, a roof over our head, clothes on our back, and shoes on our feet. And that is a testament because so many people don't want to work anymore. So after we owned the Friendly Cab Company for I think maybe a couple of years, then the Williamstown Cab in Williamstown, New Jersey, uh, somehow was being put up for sale. My stepfather heard about it, and he then purchased the Williamstown cab. So once we had the cab in Williamstown and the cab in Glassboro, they were both being run out of the basement, uh, the phones and all of that, and all of the information would go from the house in Glassboro to the Williamstown cab drivers or to the friendly cab drivers. So then my stepfather and mom decided that they wanted to purchase a building so that the, the business could be in a building and have an office space. And that's when um, Pop Purefoy and Mom uh, brought and purchased the building up in town uh, that was Sid's discount. It was Herbs before it was Sid's. And uh, when we had it, uh, Herbs was in there. And I believe before Herbs, I forget what store was in there. But anyway, we had the, the, the store there, we had the office space, and the apartments upstairs. And my stepfather rented out one of the apartments, and uh, later on, um, um, one of my brother, my youngest brother, Eric, stayed in one of the apartments. So um, after they brought the building, then the building um, office, the office for the cabs was placed there in the building. And our taxi stand was always across, the, across High Street at the bank. And that's where we would park our cabs. And that's where um, all of our business would go from. The greatest part about being in the, um, in the cab business was 
Um, all of us drove cab. I drove cab. I had my CDL. My brother Michael had his CDL, and we would drive. And what would, became exciting was when we would pick up people that had to go to the airport, those were like the best runs ever. You made good money on those runs. So it was always good. And we always had a way to make money because we, we could drive the cab and we got paid. You know, we didn't, you know, we didn't do it for free. Our, we always were paid. We always got our check, just like all the other drivers. And so that was really good. And it taught us so many things because it taught us how to be responsible. Uh, it taught us about timing. It taught us about making sure that we were being dependable and accountable. It taught us responsibility because when you're on the highway, you have to stay alert. You have to be aware. Um, in all the times that I drove the cab, I did have one fender bender, um, and I thought that was pretty good considering all things in all those years that we had the cab. So every year when I would come home for college, I would have three jobs. I would work in the school district as a teacher's aide for the elementary school kids um, in, in the, uh, for the Board of Ed for Glassford uh, Public Schools. Then I would work for the friendly cab. Um, the uh, teacher's aide job would be from like nine o'clock in the morning till 12 or whatever. I would leave there and then I would work. Um, I got a job from three to 11 working for Mrs. Paul's. And then went in between, between 12 and the three o'clock hour when I would have to be to Mrs. Paul's, I would drive the cab. And so, um, it was, a, it was a great experience, and it gave me a great work ethic. And I think that's something that's missing so much now is a work, a work ethic and people who are willing to work and who want to do the very best job that they can do. There were other businesses uh, in Glassboro, but the part about being in a cab business was that you got to go Everywhere you got to pick people up at the Acme, at the shop, right, wherever they were, and take them wherever they wanted to go. And it gave me a great sense of direction. It's very hard for you to get me lost wherever I go. I pay very, very strict attention, and I make sure I know names of streets and lefts and rights, how I got in there, and how to get out. Very important. That's one of the lessons. And then we went to church. Now on Lake Street, we had a church that was right across the street from us. And when we were young, my mom used to send us to their vacation Bible school every summer without fail. We went to vacation Bible school. We went through the program. Uh, at the end, when they had the, uh, the, the closing program, we always participated. Then my mom uh, got involved with a lady named Sister Johnson. And Sister Johnson would come and take Vernon and I to Bryant's Temple, which was down on Stanger Avenue in Glassford, New Jersey. And um, as being a part of that church, we used to sing. Uh, we were on the choir and all of that, and we would go to church there on Sunday. Now, this upset my grandfather, my grandpa Aaron, whose church was in Franklinville, New Jersey, whose church I had grew up in, whose church I watched him from, from the audience um, preaching and teaching. And um, um, my grandma would always sing and testify. And my Aunt Maggie, which was my mother, my grandmother's sister, her baby sister, she would play the piano. And when I tell you, Aunt Maggie did not know how to play the piano. She just clonked keys, but they would be singing and praising the Lord anyhow. And so um, from them, from that uh, experience, when my mom let me go to church in Bryant's Temple, it upset my grandpa. And so he got me one day when we were down for dinner or something, and he said, uh, uh, Nisi? I heard you going to that church in Glassboro. And I looked at my grandfather and I said, Grandpa, I didn't do it. You need to talk to your daughter because I had nothing to do with it. She's the one that sent me there. So I gave all the blame to her, okay? And so I guess my grandfather took it out with her because after that, I didn't hear any more about it. But we were a very, very religious 
family. Well, I won't say religious because it's not about religion. It's about relationship. And my grandfather had an awesome, awesome relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, with God. And every morning at five o'clock in the morning, he woke up and he prayed. And every night at nine o'clock before bed, he prayed. He prayed he would call each and every one of our names out loud and ask the Lord to bless us and to keep us and to protect us from dangers seen and unseen. I can literally hear his voice now as I'm saying this of my grandfather praying for us. And in his house, there was no smoking in his house. There was no television. We did have records. We did have music. You could listen to it. But any record that was in there to play, it was a gospel record. I remember all those gospel songs because those were the only ones you could play there. And he loved the Lord and my grandmother loved the Lord and they were blessed abundantly. We never wanted for anything. I always felt like I grew up in the Garden of Eden and I know that it was because of the blessings that God gave to him because of the godly man that he was and him and my grandmother. They didn't talk about it. They truly lived it. And they lived a life of faith, and they died that way. And I know one day I'll see them again because I know they're resting in Jesus' arms right now. And so even at my grandma Purifoy and Grandpa Purifoy, again, the same thing. Man and woman of God, they believed in the Lord. They worshiped. They prayed. They read their Bibles. They did those things, and their lives were blessed they lived according to the word of God, and their lives were blessed because of it. And we were blessed because of it. And we had everything we had of my grandparents, grapes and gardens and all of that. All that was because they were godly people, and they were blessed of God, and their harvests were always plentiful. And so it becomes so important that we are not forgetting that we're not in control, that God is in control. And the situations that we're in now where there's so much lawlessness and unbelief and disrespect and, and, and just no harmony in the world comes from a lack of belief and faith in God and wanting to do the right thing. So many people just want to do what they want. They just want to live any way that they want to live. And that causes our whole society to be that way. When I was growing up in Glassboro, the communities were, uh, 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 it was a village. Everybody looked out for each other. Families looked out for each other. The neighbor people looked out for each other. When we were living on Lake Street, I knew Miss Mary Ann, I knew uh, Miss Russell, I knew all their children. We all lived, looked out for each other. We all played outside. When the street lights came on, we knew it was time for all of us to go home. Everybody went home. Everybody went to a church, even if it wasn't the same church. And everybody worked together in unity and love, not trying to tear each other down. Everybody looked out for one another, and that is so missing now. You never would have found teenagers back in the day that would go somewhere and find somebody and just beat them and, and tear them up. There was respect for other people. We had respect for older people. We had respect for our parents. And the Bible says that you should respect your parents so that your life will be long. And without that, we are just living in a society where people just do anything to anybody. They have no, 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 no morals, no discernment, no wisdom, no, no empathy, no sympathy for each other in situations. And it's a really a very, very bad thing. And it's something that we all need to examine our own selves about and get back to the reality and realize that this is the life that we're living, but everything that we do, we are going to be held accountable for. There is a judge and there is a judgment. And one day we're all going to have to stand up and look in the face of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 
and tell him why we rejected him and why why we just feel as though we can just do anything we want and that we're not going to have to pay for it later. We all have to pay and we're all going to be accountable. And that's something that we all need to think about very, very seriously.